Hey everyone, welcome back. Today I want to talk about one of my favourite novels, The Plague by Albert Camus. I tried to stay off this topic for a while because obviously the whole COVID thing has really sensationalised disease, but I think it's relevant and it can help teach us about the pandemic. As a general concept, I think reading fiction to help us understand the real world is really important and underemphasized, and there's a growing belief that if it's fiction, it's not doing anything other than entertaining. When people talk about books you need to read, you see all kinds of non-fiction psychology, science, and economics books recommended. You also see heaps of philosophical texts, but usually they are essays, not stories. Much to the disappointment of philosophers everywhere, for as long as academia has been around, the best and most persuasive philosophy is not dry and factual. It almost always employs strong rhetoric, striking imagery, and a memorable tale. For the longest time, philosophy came from stories, from allegory, and from myth. This is something Camus does really well. It's what makes his work really exciting to read, as well as revelatory. And The Plague is my favourite example of this. Let's jump in. Part 1. About the Book First of all, I know it's only been out for 74 years, but there absolutely are going to be spoilers. So if you wish to read the book spoiler-free, do that first. I will say, however, that it gets better and better upon each reading, so don't worry about knowing the basic story. The book is in French, so I will be quoting from a translation, the modern library edition translated by Stuart Gilbert. The Plague was published only five years after Camus' essay, The Myth of Sisyphus. For those that don't know, Sisyphus is a Greek figure who is tasked with endlessly rolling a boulder up to the top of a hill, after which it rolls all the way back down, and he has to do it again, ad infinitum. This essay first introduced society to Camus' idea of the absurd. It's useful to know a bit about this philosophy before continuing. Camus' philosophy revolves around the idea that life and meaning are all absurd, and that we are all essentially aware of how absurd our lives and existences are. Though it's important to note that Camus is not an existentialist. Stop it. No. Stop. No. However, Camus says that love, fun, happiness, entertainment, the little things in life, are what give it meaning to us. And while life is a task, and it is ultimately meaningless, it is suffering and drudgery, we must imagine Sisyphus happy. We must soldier on in the face of the universe. That's a whole other video, there's a link in the description where you can go over to Philosophy Tube, congratulations Abigail, if you want to know more about that. You can also read the book for free online. I'm not going to tell you where, but I am going to say it's possible. This philosophy forms a base on which the book is set. In the plague, an illness strikes the city of Oran in Algeria. Seemingly out of nowhere and for no reason, and with no real solution other than to soldier on, and eventually the disease dies off on its own. In this way, the plague itself acts as a metaphor for the absurdity of the universe, and thus its indifference to human suffering and death, its utter meaninglessness. Really, however, it is doubtful if this could be called a victory. All that could be said was that the disease seemed to be leaving as unaccountably as it had come. The residents of Iran are also repeatedly described as prisoners, as they are physically restricted. This reflects Camus' idea that we must face the absurd in order to be free, and to avoid being prisoners in our own heads if we do not face it. While writing this book, Camus studied various texts and recounts about the experiences of survivors, especially doctors, during times of plague and other periods of mass disease or pestilence in history. So it does tend to be quite accurate in many respects, and is itself presented as a recount of events. At the end of the book, it is revealed to have been narrated from the perspective of Dr. Ryu, the main character, which is fairly obvious as you read, to be honest. We can generally fit Camus' idea of his own philosophy and beliefs into the character of the Doctor, which is reinforced by the fact that Ryu is just the one telling us the story, which in a meta sense is Camus telling us the story anyway. Part 2. Themes Monotony Throughout the book, many characters, particularly Grom, who we will discuss later, show a distinct struggle with selecting the right words to express their feelings. Camus too writes in a style that is not so much a straight retelling, 
as a close approximation of events. He is sometimes intricate to the point of monotony. This section leapt out at me the first time I read the plague during coronavirus. For while he spoke from the depths of long days of brooding upon his personal distress, this meant nothing to the man to whom he was speaking. Even the sincerest grief had to make do with the set phrases of ordinary conversation. Only on these terms could the prisoners of the plague ensure the sympathy of their concierge and the interest of their hearers. I think this is a really salient point at the moment. While often people have experienced terrifying things, true grief and longing, we're so saturated with that commentary and some of us have no real reference point for it. It's strikingly easy to just say, yeah, I know, me too. I don't know how long it's been since I asked someone how they are, and they haven't immediately brought up how they've been in reference to the pandemic. COVID has become the weather of small talk, and I wonder how long it will be until it's no longer that. It's sometimes hard to tell which events will be historic, but we are living in a time that is clearly going to be so. When do we switch from, this is a thing that is happening now, to, I lived through that historic time? Perhaps the hardest thing is the no end in sight mentality that COVID has forced us to adopt, the waiting. Yes, plague, like abstraction, was monotonous. Perhaps only one factor changed, and that was Ryu himself. Standing at the foot of the Statue of the Republic that evening, he felt it. All he was conscious of was a bleak indifference steadily gaining on him. Eventually, people just want to go outside, get back to life, see friends again. That desire can only hold out so long. There's no sense of stability and no return to the normal. People often have problems with the fact that lots of things are marathons, not sprints. They can't be rushed because time is the key ingredient. Even as the plague in Iran reaches its most deadly point, this is still the case. It's kind of like, well, it's not over yet, it won't be for a long time, but there's no sense of immediacy, just a miasma of suffering. The truth is that nothing is less sensational than pestilence. In the memories of those who lived through them, the grim days of plague do not stand out like vivid flames, ravenous and inextinguishable, beaconing a troubled sky, but rather like the slow, deliberate progress of some monstrous thing, crushing out all upon its path. It was, above all, a shrewd, unflagging adversary, a skilled organiser, doing his work thoroughly and well. The effect of a pandemic on the structure of society is not unlike the effect of protracted illness or old age on a person's body. It is slow and deliberate, Rarely does someone just die all of a sudden. They die in parts over months or years or decades. Misinformation and bureaucracy. In Oran, the announcement of this disease specifically being labeled plague faces pushback from bureaucrats who are more worried about liability than the risk to life. What if businesses have to shut down? You don't want to panic everyone over nothing. This is a similar case to what happened with the World Health Organization and how slow they were to label COVID a pandemic. It's even pointed out in the book that it doesn't matter what you call it, whether it's a pandemic or not, but you need to act as if it is anyway. What saves lies is prompt action, not a label. It comes to this. We are to take the responsibility of acting as though the epidemic were plague. It doesn't matter to me how you phrase it. My point is that we should not act as if there were no likelihood that half the population would be wiped out, for then it would be. There are also myths that go around in Iran that this wine or that tea or these spices will offer a cure or protection against plague, and of course always religious zealots proclaiming that the plague is due to blasphemy. Whereas now we have Sky News, Fox, the Bill Gates conspiracy, QAnon, China myths, and former presidents spreading misinformation about COVID and what it is, how severe it is, or if it even exists, and also a fundamental misunderstanding of vaccines and the testing they require in order to be safe. I don't think that technology makes these ideas any more or less prevalent. Humans are full of misgivings and suspicion. 
but the internet has given those people the ability to combine and find one another and amplify those voices. On a side note, we think of people of the past as being daft and stupid, but generally people have listened to doctors far more in the past than now. They were closer to death and even if doctors didn't know the answer, they were still trying their best. This is the worst pandemic in terms of misinformation and disobedience we've ever had, but this is by no means the first example. I recommend checking out the podcast Things You Missed in History class in their recap episode about the 1918 pandemic. There are so many parallels there too. There is civil disobedience and other antisocial behaviour as a result of plague rules in the book too. The town is locked down and some pushback occurs, a small amount of violence is aroused, and some deaths are caused as people try to leave the town and have to be shot. However, more notable is the presence of opportunistic and petty crime like theft. Houses that had been burnt or closed by the sanitary control were looted. However, it seems unlikely that these excesses were premeditated. Usually, it was some chance incentive that led normally well-behaved people to acts which promptly had their imitators. Curfew hours are also put into place, not just to limit the spread of plague, but also to avoid these lootings. One of the major differences with the plague in Iran and the pandemic now is that despite the misinformation and delays caused by tentative governments, proper pandemic understanding and medical technology are far more advanced than Camus could have conceived as he wrote his novel. Whereas Dr. Ryu notes that at a certain point, there was nothing that could be done. They had no cure for the disease. He knew that, over a period whose end he could not glimpse, his task was no longer to cure, but to diagnose, to detect, to see, to describe, to register, and then condemn. That was his present function. Some of the early COVID-19 infections looked like this might be the case, but for the most part people got better or could be kept alive to have a fighting chance. Additionally, the speed with which vaccines can now be developed when the money and political will is behind them is astonishing. Overall, we are really lucky that we are in this situation this time. With growing bacterial resistance and other biological threats looming on the horizon, the only thing that may save people next time might be policy, not technology. The work and unity. Among all the controversy and infighting of COVID, the pandemic has overwhelmingly become a common enemy. People were providing help sometimes weeks or months at a time, even while unemployed, to make sure others have food, masks and sanitizer if they're homeless or poor. Work for those that have it, or hobbies and passions, fulfill a similar psychological role to this. Those that can work from home or devote time to interests they previously could not are spared from thinking too much about the people around them that are suffering. It's kind of surreal here in Australia because we're so far from true danger. Except from Australia itself, the spiders, snakes, sharks, birds, cone snails, jellyfish, crocodiles, stonefish, camels driving, camels driving, octopuses, the sea itself, the sun, and of course the droplets. In lots of other countries right now, it really is like the town of Oran. More people in the community have coronavirus and there's a real risk of contracting it, especially if you're one of the various medical workers who have been working overtime to try and stop the disease. In Oran, work or leisure, really anything that can keep the townsfolk busy, becomes a focus too. Most work stops altogether. Camus kind of skips over that bit. Presumably there's no ultra-capitalist incentive to continue regular work like rent. The work that does continue is a bit more severe. They are largely medical or security jobs and they include a high degree of risk. Ryu notes that the spread and efficiency with which bodies must be buried in mass graves gives the burial workers no time to spare. They have a combined mission just like we have and they are doing it for the good of their community. It is a task that come rain, hail or shine has to be done even though after a while, they too begin inevitably to suffer for it. Thus, the growing complications of our everyday life, which might have been an affliction, prove to be a blessing in disguise. Many of the grave diggers, stretcher bearers and the like, public servants to begin with, and later volunteers, died of plague. 
However stringent the precautions, sooner or later, contagion did its work. Later in the book, one of the minor characters, Judge Oton, is sent to a camp because he needs to be quarantined. He then loses his young son to plague, in a scene that really epitomizes the drama of the novel and how it approaches suffering. The sense of comradeship and sacrifice in Iran reaches its zenith, when once Oton is declared well, he asks to return to the camp. Ryu couldn't believe his ears. But you've only just come out of it. I'm afraid I did not make myself clear. I'm told there are some voluntary workers from government offices in that camp. It would keep me busy, you see. And also, I know it may sound absurd, but I'd feel less separated from my little boy. Ryu understands and lets him go back to the camp and help. Later, Oton dies as a result of catching plague. It's not just in work that we see this unity, though. We also see it when an overwhelming proportion of the public changes their behaviour to socially distance, wear masks, not shake hands. All of those things are not just unity, but also solidarity with our neighbours who aren't as lucky. As tacky as it sounds, we are actually in this together. Human cost and suffering. The cost of pestilence is not just measured in lives not lived or years unspent, it is also in the quality of the hours we spend. In terms of disease, the cost is most prevalent in that it is human life, and it is explicitly being taken early, but it is also emotional. Camus describes how the dreariness of plague affected the lives of the townsfolk who were not infected, how they felt trapped and frustrated. Hostile to the past, impatient of the present, and cheated of the future. We were much like those whom men's justice or hatred forces to live behind prison bars. There are always arguments about how we value life when it must be balanced against economy or freedom. This is the same everywhere. Anytime a politician controls the pandemic spread, they are crucified for destroying the economy and accused of taking the last step towards 1984. And everywhere they don't lock down, the economy is relatively fine, but more people are dying every month or week than other countries have lost in total. In one of these scenarios, life takes precedent. In the other, the quality of life for those still left to live their lives. Well, that's the narrative anyway, isn't it? Sometimes it's worth being a bit looser with restrictions and regulations in order to preserve personal freedoms. However, sometimes it has dire consequences. In the real world now, just as in Iran, we are starting to see mass burials occurring. That obviously has a physical cost to the people who died, but also it has an emotional and spiritual cost to the relatives left behind. For some people, not being able to go exactly where someone was buried can mean no real closure for them. There's a reason we do so much to try and bring back whatever we can when soldiers die overseas. There is also an element of shock in mass disease and war alike that we are simply not used to bearing, as Camus points out. There have been as many plagues as wars in history, yet always plagues and wars take people equally by surprise. It might also be said that war is likewise indifferent to human suffering, and just as random and pointless as disease. Even if we put aside all the people who die, not many people ever really come back the same. For some people, those traumatic experiences might be the same with COVID. I'm lucky enough to not have lost anyone during the pandemic and to be in a relatively safe country. We have virtually zero cases now. But even hearing the other day about someone I know whose aunt died of COVID in the UK gave me a bit of grounding, a bit of realization that this is real and it is happening. Saying those things don't happen here is a legitimate way of coping for some people we have many comforts we like to tell ourselves. Almost 3 million people have died of COVID. That's a very abstract number for humans. It's so outside of our scope that we can't really comprehend it. And it's important to remember those are real people with real lives, by some reckoning the only one they'll ever have. Death, disease and suffering don't just affect the dead. It affects everyone else too. The whole human world is made and sustained by ripples. Unfairness and Time 
Perhaps the most human reaction to feel during a pandemic is, this isn't fair, which is a constant symptom of assuming the universe has a mandate, which as we know, is exactly what Camus denies. During COVID, the course of justice has slowed down or been suspended because there are bigger things happening right now, bigger issues. Medical care slows down for anything other than testing, work slows down and in some cases disappears entirely. People are denied justice because courts aren't open, companies are using coronavirus as an excuse to fire people they haven't been allowed to let go for years while their profits soar, and doctors are warning of an increase in the rate of cancer deaths in coming years due to delayed diagnosis and treatment. Some of these things, like companies taking advantage of a global crisis in order to profit, are absolutely unfair, because they have a human element that is causing undue suffering. Other things, however, such as the fact that there is a pandemic at all, aren't unfair so much as unfortunate. No one controls this, it just is. Unless it's Bill Gates. Similarly, one thing that doesn't stop is time. If you have to pay rent, that's still due. If you need urgent medical treatment, it's still urgent. But systems are under strain and time-sensitive opportunities are lost. Tied into all these things is a sense of unfairness, that idea of, that doesn't happen here, or to us, we're the lucky country. People are in disbelief that this can even happen. It's unthinkable. Everyone knows it's ceased to appear in Western Europe. Yes, everyone knew that, except the dead men. As an aside, Camus often relates war and disease in the plague. In fact, when you read it, Look out for some not so veiled references to the Nazi occupation of France, such as when the town begins filling with rats at the start of the novel, and Ryu's mother comments, It's like that sometimes. I'm glad to be with you again, Bernard. The rats can't change that anyhow. Camus consistently, through his lens as Ryu, criticises the idea that the plague isn't that serious, and that it will just blow over and end. Camus himself was a member of the French Resistance in World War II, where he wrote for underground newspapers, so he knows something of this denialism, but also of legitimate fear and self-preservation. And people did say that about COVID, that it can't be a pandemic, that it won't be that bad. People have been caught in unfair circumstances because of COVID, from which they have still not been liberated. Australian citizens are still overseas as I speak, and Australia is basically COVID-free at this point yet they still can't come back. These themes that I've talked about reverberate through the story, and as I hope I have shown, through the world today. But they are articulated by the book's fantastic characters. When it comes to feelings of unfairness and restriction of freedom, Camus instills them in the character Rombert. Part 3. Characters. Rombert. Rombert is a reporter from Paris that was in Oran at the time of the plague and subsequent lockdown, and whose primary reason for wanting to leave is that he was only supposed to be there for a short time, and his sweetheart was back in Paris waiting for him. We've seen the inverse of this in Australia in two ways, mostly people saying they live here, they belong here, they work here, but because they're not citizens, they're not eligible for assistance, particularly Chinese students, who have no work in their affected industries, so they need to go home to live. And now they're not allowed back into Australia. Some of those people will never come back to Australia. Some will never continue their studies. To some, this is a full stop, not a delay. The other people who have suffered from this are Australian citizens who are overseas at the time of the Australian travel lockdown and cannot return. Over 39,000 people at the last count. Rombert fits more into this category and he feels exactly as they do, that he doesn't belong in Iran, he belongs at home. Furthermore, because of when the book is set, communication is very difficult. All the people have to send messages are telegrams. Now we have more advanced methods so we can still study, work, talk face to face over the internet, but we have realised perhaps to some people's surprise that those things are not the same as physically seeing someone. The perceived injury to his personal freedoms drives Rombert through various bureaucratic channels, then to Dr. Ryu, then eventually to an illegal smuggler that he believes can get him out of the city. Rombert feels entitled to his freedoms, even if they could endanger people. Just as during COVID,
people still have parties, leave lockdown, don't wear a mask, or drive 300 kilometers to get a Big Mac. They went on doing business, arranged for journeys, and formed views. How should they have given a thought to anything like plague, which rules out any future, cancels journeys, silences the exchange of views? They fancied themselves free, and no one will ever be free so long as there are pestilences. All of these traits make Rombert the idealist in favour of what he frequently describes as love, or to put it more succinctly, respect for the rights and feelings of the individual. On multiple occasions he says that it is neither his job nor his responsibility to fight the plague, that he has no place in Iran, and that he only knows what he must do for himself. Rombert turns from the demanding child to a responsible adult. He goes from believing that he does not belong in Iran, trying to escape by any means necessary, and being sure that no one understands his grief, to being a willing participant in helping battle the plague and foregoing his chance to leave Iran illegally, even though he desires it. At the end of the book, Rombert is reunited with his sweetheart at the train station in Iran, where they leave together. Grom. Gron is the common man in the book, but he is also kind of the people's hero. Gron is not really remarkable as a person, he has failed to climb the ladder of his profession, failed also to keep his marriage together, and during the book is revealed to be writing a novel of which he has only ever written the first sentence over several years, and keeps changing it because he is not happy with it. When the plague becomes a real threat, Gron leaps into action setting up teams of volunteers to help combat it, he sees this as common sense, not heroism or duty, which again speaks to his character as a useful but unremarkable person. Ryu even notes that he is so normal that he is having trouble imagining Grand in the midst of an outbreak of plague. He's the kind of man that always escapes in such cases. Ryu remembered having read somewhere that the plague spared weak constitutions, and chose its victims chiefly among the robust. Gron is either unsure or indecisive with his words. Almost every time he talks, he seems to be struggling to select the right words, or that he was worried that his words might offer the wrong impression, or that they would offend when honestly he is nothing against a person. Likewise, throughout the book he is writing his novel, and he keeps changing tiny details about the first sentence after long-winded discussions, and it becomes something of an inside joke. Gron says that his first sentence must be perfect. What I really want, Doctor, is this. On the day when the manuscript reaches the publisher, I want him to stand up, after he's read it through, of course, and say to his staff, Gentlemen, hats off. Gron reminds us that the universe has no mandate. The reason he cannot find the perfect sentence, and that he cannot move on to the next sentence, is that there is fundamentally no objective to the universe. Again, Gron is the people's hero, and in being so has an exaggerated version of the problems that affect all of us, including this search for objective meaning where none can be found. Later in the book, Gron actually gets the plague, but he miraculously recovers, and is the first patient to do so, which marks a turning point for the progress of the disease in the town. His experiences reflect that of the townsfolk at large. At the end of the book, Gron has grown from his experience and learned. He starts his book again and is ready to continue writing, and he finally writes a letter to Jeanne, his ex-wife, as he has wanted to do for years. He's written to Jeanne and was feeling much happier. Also, he'd made a fresh start with his phrase, I've cut out all the adjectives. There's not much more to say about Gron. He is an endearing character. Panelu. Father Panelu is the local priest in Iran, and is the one spreading controversy and blame about the plague via religion. In his first real address in the book, he gives a sermon. He conjures up the image of a biblical angel thrusting its spear into the houses of the impious and wretched insisting that the citizens of Iran brought the plague upon themselves by being casually devoted. You fondly believed it was enough to visit God on Sundays, and thus you could make free of your weekdays. You believe some brief formalities, some bendings of the knee, 
would recompense him well enough for your criminal indifference. But God is not mocked. It's important to remember in the backdrop of the novel that to Camus the plague is random, simply part of life, and the religious fervour of Panelou serves to try and give some reason for the plague. Of Father Panelou's speech, Ryu says, I've seen too much of hospitals to relish any ideas of collective punishment, but as you know, Christians sometimes say that sort of thing without really thinking it. They are better than they seem. Every country priest who visits his parishioners and has heard a man gasping for breath on his deathbed thinks as I do. He'd try to relieve human suffering before trying to point out its excellence. This still happens today. We have priests in Australia who frequently denounce the gays for bringing sin to the country and causing floods and bushfires and all manner of disasters. This has obviously also happened with the pandemic. But not only are these people an extreme minority, they are scared, angry, and trying to reconcile what they're seeing with their view of the world, and that at least is understandable. I don't think many priests or religious people in general are mean judgmental zealots that want everyone to burn. Most people approach religion for humanitarian reasons, and when confronted with real world scenarios are the same as anyone else. They are human first. This is part of why Ryu later notes of Panelu that no one in the world believed in a god of that sort. No, not even Panelu, who believed that he believed in such a god. And it's worth noting that this experience of religion reconciling with reality forms a pivotal point of Panelu's character. He eventually does join a task force that helps combat the plague, and he does see suffering and finds it hard to imagine a world in which God is what he thinks it is. After the death of Judge Oton's son, Father Panelou has something of a crisis of faith, and Ryu finds during his next sermon that his manner is somewhat changed. He seems less full of conviction and more of gentleness. A yet more noteworthy change was that instead of saying you, he now said we. What he, Father Panelou, had said in his first sermon still held good, and yet, perhaps, his words and thoughts had lacked in charity. The speech covers several pages and it's really quite interesting, but here are the footnotes. Before, Panelou believed in God's word, and his belief was so strong that the plague must be the will of God, and who is he to stand against God? So he must will what God wills. So he explains the plague in his own way. Then later, he sees the suffering of the child, the human cost of the plague, and he finds it difficult to reconcile, ultimately admitting as much in his sermon, in which he says, and I paraphrase, the will of God is ultimately good, as such his will should be ours also. Yet still, I cannot find it within myself to will the suffering of this child. As such, he ultimately concludes that essentially religion is a package deal. Religion in a time of plague could not be the religion of every day. While God might accept and even desire that the soul should take its ease and rejoice in happier times, in periods of extreme calamity, he laid extreme demands on it. That is the faith, cruel in men's eyes and crucial in God's, which we must ever strive to compass. This obviously gets into like, several thousand years worth of debates about religion and the nature of belief, and I'm not going to go into that. This is long form enough. Shortly afterwards, Panelou becomes ill and later passes away, while still in the middle of his crisis of faith. When Panelou dies, he still does not know if he can accept the suffering of the world as the will of God. He has experienced the human cost of the plague, and it has taken a toll on his belief. He is in a place of doubt. Ryu likewise puts on his index card after his death, Doubtful Case, indicating that it may not have been plague that took him. For all medicine's advances, he too is in a place of doubt. And most importantly, we as the reader are also left with no illumination as to the actual cause of the priest's death. Faith is an important part of how people deal with loss, and during COVID it has been stretched to its limits. There are some good signs of religion, fostering a sense of community, rituals to help sustain people, 
positive reframing of events, and then there are the bad sides of it, disregarding health measures because it's all in God's hands, feeling punished and guilty, and the distress that comes with struggling with the morality of belief. Camus' exploration of religion is really good because he touches on all those aspects and how they are reflected in the religious habits of the people of Oran, and in a more focused sense within the actions and words of Father Panelu. Taro Now Taro can be confusing, so stick with me here. Taro is a traveller from out of town who has been in Oran for several weeks. He is fond of sea swimming, drinking, eating well, talking with all manner of people, and is described as generally good-humoured. He also keeps a diary of the townsfolk he sees around Oran, which helps Ryu build the chronicle of the plague. Taro becomes a close friend of Ryu's during the story, and in many ways is similar to Ryu, though his approach is less scientific, more thoughtful and philosophical. He is the one to give us many of the defining ideas of the novel. The main one we are concerned with is the idea that, in a conceptual sense, we all have the plague. We can all contribute to, or cause, death. In his mind, either we are on the side of humanity and we are ultimately victims, or we are on the side of the plague, the force that causes death, which he articulates when he talks about his father. Taro's father was a cruel judge and sentenced many people to death. One day, when Taro was in court observing him, he condemned a man to hang, and Taro had a change of heart in that moment. Seeing that man be put to death, he felt kinship with the criminal instead of solidarity with his father. He chose the side of humanity. After this experience, Taro became an agitator and decided to protest against capital punishment. Within the circles in which he was active, he becomes convinced that the occasional death sentence was good, and that certain murders were okay, in order to lead to a world in which there were no murders at all. But Taro then realised again the cost of death, and that he was no better than his father, and that he was also part of the system that takes life. We are all part of it. And thus I came to understand that I, anyhow, had had plague through all those long years in which, paradoxically enough, I would believed with all my soul that I was fighting it. I learned that I had had an indirect hand in the deaths of thousands of people, that I'd even brought about their deaths by approving of acts and principles which could only end that way. Taro felt kinship with the man in court because he was condemned, and Taro is too. We are all condemned at different times and in different ways. That is why Taro values being careful, aware, a modern term might be mindful, of the suffering we cause and to try and be as innocent of murder as he can be when all is told. He reflects that, because of his history, the plague is simply the ability of our choices to bring about death, willfully or otherwise, and as such we are all afflicted by plague, and we have to do whatever we can to minimise it. For many years I have been ashamed, mortally ashamed, of having been, even with the best intentions, even at many removes, a murderer in my turn. That, too, is why this epidemic has taught me nothing new, except that I must fight it at your side. I know positively that each of us has the plague within him. No one, no one on earth, is free from it. Taro can be a confusing figure, as he's definitely the most philosophical character. In short, he represents a few things. Firstly, he shows us that if plague or death is part of all our lives and is our joined responsibility, then when the pandemic is over, those hard-learned lessons are still relevant. They are everyday concerns. Secondly, he reminds us that facing the inevitable pointlessness of life and eventual death is not a bad thing. It is freeing. It allows us to face the world on our own terms and to know that the next thing he represents is special because of this contrast. Thirdly, he reminds us what is truly important. After this conversation with Ryu about death and his father, Taro highlights the side of Camus' philosophy that doesn't concern death, life, enjoyment, and happiness. Once they were on the pier, they saw the sea spread out before them, a gently heaving expanse of deep piled velvet, supple and sleek as a creature of the wild. 
Before them, the darkness stretched out into infinity. Ryu could feel under his hand the gnarled, weather-worn visage of the rocks, and a strange happiness possessed him. Turning to Taro, he caught a glimpse on his friend's face of the same happiness. A happiness that forgets nothing, not even murder. After swimming, Taro and Ryu go back home and continue their fight against the plague. Again, Taru reminds us that though we must take pleasure in the little things, inevitably we must return to our task, and those ideas of not becoming complacent must still stick around in our heads. Anyway, that's Taro, perhaps the most intricate character in the plague, and trust me, there's more to talk about too. I don't know if it's a particularly Algerian thing to do, but sea swimming is mentioned everywhere in Camus' writings, in his interviews, philosophy, poetry, journals, novels. It's clearly a pastime that he is personally fond of, and that he associates with happiness, but it also has philosophical significance. The weightlessness and freedom of floating in space, surrounded by a force that is vast and indifferent, yet beautiful, unknown, full of things that can kill you. Tell me that's a coincidence. Ryu. Ryu is the narrator of the book, a humanist, an atheist, a healer, and ultimately a human first, flawed but trying his best. He is also very clearly Camus' own lens within the book. He sees the chronicle that he has left, in this case the book we are reading, to be his duty, and to be as complete as it can be from the perspective he has seen and from Taru's notebook, which contained lots of details about the plague and his time in Iran. Ryu is not a hero, and he denies there is anything heroic about what he is doing, but he must continue doing it anyway. The fact that the novel becomes very introspective, downtrodden, plodding, is really very understandable as Ryu recounts how he works tirelessly but often fruitlessly and for longer and longer hours, until he becomes disillusioned by his efforts. Ryu clashes with Rombert when Rombert accuses him of thinking purely in abstractions and ideals, about what should be done and how people can help, without accounting for their feelings or freedoms, or treating them as people. Essentially, he is accused of being cold. Rombert even says that Ryu cannot understand because he has nothing to lose, before learning that his wife is ill and that he was separated from her at the start of the plague, just as Rombert is from his love. I suppose you don't know that Ryu's wife is in a sanatorium, a hundred miles or so away. Rombert showed surprise and began to say something, but Taro had already left the room. Despite this encounter, Rombert does grow as a character and apologises for this comment, eventually joining Ryu in fighting the plague and choosing not to leave Oran. Ryu also clashes with Pamelu after seeing the child die in the hospital the pivotal emotional scene for Panelu that leads to his last sermon. But as much as he has harsh words with the priest about the child's suffering and God's will, he does find some common ground on which to settle. We're working side by side for something that unites us, beyond blasphemy and prayers, and it's the only thing that matters. Yes, yes, you too are working for man's salvation. Salvation's much too big a word for me, I don't aim so high. I'm concerned with man's health, and for me, his health comes first. As mentioned previously, Taro and Ryu become good friends, and a few days after the plague is officially over, Taro falls ill, and Ryu confides in his mother that Taro, against all odds, might have plague, and she immediately leaps back to the idea that, surely that's not possible, not now, not here because to her, and to the townsfolk, the plague is over. I'm sure that's something that we'll be saying too, once Covid is gone. Even as Taro slowly dies, Camus throws us this thought. For the first time, the doctor realised that this night, without the clang of ambulances and full of belated wayfarers, was just like a night of the past. A plague-free night. And yet, the plague itself is still here. His friend is in the house with him dying from it, and another character is still yet to pass, even after the plague is gone. Taro's death marks one of the last deaths from plague, even after we think we are kind of in the clear, 
and certainly it's one of the last deaths that we are concerned with. It makes no real statement other than Camus hammering home the idea that death, suffering, the plague, and ultimately life are senseless and random. Remember that Camus' philosophy is that the universe is indifferent to our suffering, and this marks just another event that is a reminder of that. In an almost identical way to Taro and Panelou's deaths, and reflecting Rombert's relationship with his sweetheart in Paris, Ryu's wife dies from an unrelated, undisclosed illness while outside of town and separate from Ryu, and after the plague is officially over, and in a totally senseless and meaningless way. In Taro's view, you would say she has been innocently murdered, condemned by the plague just as he had been only a day before. Ryu realises that there is no true difference in one death compared to the next. For many months and for the last two days, it was the self-same suffering going on and on. It's no mistake that the close of Rombert's story comes next in the book, where he finally is reunited with his young love, Rombert, who of all people was critical of the Doctor for not being able to see his position, for not having a heart. The Doctor was much in the same position, but also knew that his wife was dying, and knew that he would have no respite from death. For the mothers, husbands, wives, and lovers who had lost all joy, now that the loved one lay under a layer of quicklime in a death pit, or was a mere handful of indistinctive ashes in a grey mound, the plague had not yet ended. Ryu is a very straightforward character. He is the one with the most interactions, around whom most characters change and clash and grow. This is partly because his is the perspective that we are given, but he is also most directly involved in the day-to-day -day management of the plague. Kota. Kotar is the most obvious character in the plague by far. We first meet him when Gron learns Ryu of the fact that a man from out of town has been found attempting to commit suicide in his rented room. I mentioned earlier that during times of disease, justice slows down. Well in this particular case, Kotar has committed a serious but undisclosed crime and is due to be in court, but he is not jailed or summoned to court as he expects to be because the plague renders the justice system useless for over a year. Kotar attempts to take his life because he sees no way to escape from the fate he has become resigned to. But once the plague arrives, that all changes. Kotar begins to be more outgoing, he starts trading goods to make a profit, and he begins to meet more people. He is even the contact that presents Rombert with the possibility of being smuggled out of the city. Kotar is alone in his fear, and Camus writes him very well. We feel for him because he is clearly suffering, even despite the fact that he is actually now committing more crimes during the plague. Kotar has a deep desire to not be alone, constantly looking for friends and good character references. Loneliness is not a good thing for anyone, and that touches something in us. Even the most stoic characters like Ryu need occasional social boys like Taro to get them through the hard times in Iran. Kotar never had that support until there was plague. When the plague or coronavirus comes to the world or a whole city, all these lonely people are now part of a group of shared suffering, and those groups provide solidarity. As Taro writes in his journal, Fear seems to him more bearable under these conditions than it was when he had to bear its burden alone. In this respect he's wrong, and this makes him harder to understand than other people. Still, after all, that's why he is worth a greater effort to understand. Kotar is at first suicidal before the plague hits, then as soon as everything locks down, he is positively chipper. He buys and trades, he makes friends, goes out to eat, he is finally able to live his life on the same terms as everyone else. Or rather, they are now living on his. It's important to note that Kotar never hampers the plague effort, but he simply doesn't help it either, which is understandable. Kotar thrives in plague time because it means he is no longer alone. He is still afraid of losing his life, his freedom, his health, but now all of Oran are afraid and people finally know what it's like for him every day. As the city becomes more healthy and the plague fades, he begins to worry about his future again. 
he makes thinly veiled bargains in conversations about what happens next. But what do you mean by a return to normal life? Taro smiled. New films at the picture houses. But Kotar didn't smile. Was it supposed, he asked, that the plague wouldn't have changed anything and the life of the town would go on as before, exactly as if nothing had happened? What interested him was knowing whether the whole administration wouldn't be changed, lock, stock and barrel. Whether, for instance, the public services would function as before. Unfortunately, it doesn't go well for Kotar. When the plague ends, Kotar becomes paranoid and mad, and ends up being arrested after a shootout with the police, because he knows they are eventually going to come and take him away. He is racked by fear, just as he was in the beginning. Something that has come to light during COVID is isolation. There's a lot of mental health awareness going around at the moment with regards to how that has affected people. Some people might have been in relative isolation for over a year now because of COVID, but they are all in it together. Here in Melbourne, we had an actual lockdown, not like what other countries consider a lockdown. And there were some people who had no human contact for four months. And then again in the second lockdown for another two or so months. Now consider what it's like to be isolated from people for say, three years or five or 10. Whether that's physically, emotionally, because of some illness or condition. Those people are out there and they have been suffering a very long time. I hope one of the things we learn as a community from the pandemic is what it's like to be Kota and to be isolated, alone, maybe afraid, because ultimately I hope it leads to compassion for those people. Even though Kotar is a criminal before the plague, and even though he begins to commit more crimes and take advantage of the situation during the plague, and even afterwards, when he has some kind of break and is involved in a shootout, it's still hard not to feel for him and not to see him as a kind of victim. His only real crime is that of having in his heart approved of something that killed off men, women and children. I can understand the rest, but for that, I am obliged to pardon him. It is fitting that this chronicle should end with some reference to that man, who had an ignorant, that is to say, lonely heart. The Plague is a great novel, and I recommend it very highly. It's a short book and it shouldn't take you that long to work through. I dearly hope you read it. The character studies available in the book are some of the most thorough and consistent I know of. But also the sheer beauty of the writing and mastery of the form is something Camus does so well, and also that Stuart Gilbert translates so well. I think that there's a lot to learn from this book given the times we find ourselves in, but it's also full of sound philosophy, as Camus always provides. As I mentioned in the intro, there's a growing tendency to believe that fiction is entertainment and that it doesn't really have a role in teaching us anything. I think that this book shows how wrong that is. So that's all for this video, but before you go, as always, I want to leave you something to go away with. Did you know that Hugh Laurie is an accomplished New Orleans blues musician? He does a fantastic cover of St. James Infirmary, a piece that is mentioned multiple times in, you guessed it, The Plague, link below. On the topic of blues, the Byron Bay Blues Festival was cancelled this year, the day before it was set to start, after just three cases of COVID were found in the local area. Even while sporting events that flew high-profile sports people in from overseas were allowed to continue. In this case, I guess it's because one makes vastly more money than the other. Sadly, Bluesfest couldn't get any level of insurance, so they made a massive loss, and obviously it was a huge disappointment to all involved. So I will leave a link below to the set list from Bluesfest, you should check the artists out. Ash Grunwald is a particularly good act, as is the indigenous artist Briggs, who I've mentioned before. Hopefully live music will get back to normal soon, even if it is a new kind of normal. Thanks everyone for watching. Like, comment, subscribe, share, do all that good stuff, and stay safe. Calmly they denied in the teeth of the evidence that we had ever known a crazy world in which men were killed off like flies, or that precise savagery, that calculated frenzy of the plague which instilled an odious freedom as to all that was not the here and now, or those charnel house stenches which stupefied whom they did not kill. 
In short, they denied that we had ever been that hag-ridden populace, a part of which was daily fed into a furnace and went up in oily fumes, while the rest, in shackled impotence, waited their turn. And it was in the midst of shouts rolling against the terrace wall in massive waves that waxed in volume and duration, while cataracts of coloured fire fell thicker through the darkness, that Dr. Ryu resolved to compile this chronicle, so that he should bear witness in favour of those plague-stricken people, so that some memorial of the injustice and outrage done them might endure, and to state, quite simply, what we learn in a time of pestilence, that there are more things to admire in men than to despise.